Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Mythic Plus series for healing the hardest bosses, this time the Season 4 Dragonflight Edition. We're gonna go through the more challenging bosses in every single Mythic Plus dungeon and we're going to talk about strats on how to heal them, a little tips and tricks on how to make them easier. The first boss in Ruby Life Pools could be quite challenging but there are a few tips that can make it easier. First, try to stack the crystals so you have more space around the room and if you get the white chill sworn circle, run away from the crystals and not behind them so that people do not get sucked in on top of a crystal. As for healing, make sure to save small cooldowns and stop people off before the white circle explodes because as long as people survive the blast from the circle, you have plenty of time to top them up after that and you can even slow down the healing and stagger a little bit as there's plenty of time until the next white circle comes. The other big tip for phase 1 is if you get the circle, make sure you have some kind of a movement ability so you jump out of the circle as quickly as possible and you don't take extra damage. Same thing if it happens to your teammates and you can either tiger lust them or life grip them, anything you can do to prevent them from taking extra damage because if that happens then you will have to top them up and heal them even more before the circle explodes. As for phase 2, make sure to save a big cooldown for that and keep in mind that this is going to happen only twice during the fight. The AoE damage is going to stop not when you break the shield but when you interrupt the boss after that so spare an interrupt for sure. And also stack on top of the boss even if you're ranged so your tank can not easily get aggro on the little whelplings that spawn. Once that happens, keep an eye on them because they're going to get a debuff from the whelplings that stacks and if they get to 8, they're gonna get stunned, so make sure to dispel them if the count gets higher. And lastly, when it comes to defensives, group defensives should go into phase 2 and the personals you can also use there, but if you get low during phase 1 or you get a circle and you're not quick enough to get out of it, you can use your personals in those situations as well. The second boss in Ruby Life Pools is all about positioning. She's going to summon an elemental and then she's going to follow up with two boulders that she throws at random people. At all times you want to be aware of your positioning so you bait those to the direction that you came from in order not to surround yourself with fire and wipe this way. Once the elementals die they spawn a big circle that you need to run out from and even during this time you can get targeted by a boulder so make sure you're running it to an angle and not towards the path that you're going to go to next. If you have to you can run on top of the lava shortly it's not going to do a lot of damage and once the elementals come you have to keep interrupting them. Usually the first interrupt is going to be the melee and the tank so you can save yours as a backup for later on. When it comes to healing, the elementals are going to cast Inferno which does AoE damage to your whole group and leaves a dot on every player. Your goal here is not to top everybody up, you need to put enough healing into them just so they survive the dot and then you have to focus your attention towards the tank. The boss is going to cast tearing blows at the same time which does a lot of damage to the tank and increases the damage they take so they will be in imminent danger of dying. Of course they should be using defensives but they're often going to need some help from you as well to heal them and that could be the case while you're moving away from the exploding elemental and you will have to heal on the move. So the tips here are do a little bit of AoE healing to keep everybody alive then focus your tank and once they survive the searing blows you have plenty of time to top everybody else up before the next elemental comes. You have approximately 35 seconds in between the Inferno cast that do a lot of AoE damage. So depending on your class, plan your cooldowns accordingly. The last tip to mention here is that the boulders explode into a small area once they hit a wall and they can also explode if they hit one of the curbs or the little benches around the area. So be aware of that and yes that's a little bit tricky but try to bait the boulders away from the curbs and the benches so you don't get accidentally blown off the map. 
for the last boss in Ruby Life Pools, I'm going to recommend for you to get some weak auras to make your life a lot easier. The first one is going to be tracking when the nest cloud burst from Erhard is going to go off as this does every damage but it also silences you if you're casting so you need to not be casting when that happens. The second one tracks where the next wind is going to blow to and basically tells you where to drop the fire puddles if you get them so you can keep the platform clean and have plenty of space. Of course the main thing here is watch the dragon and dodge the frontals and keep dispelling your tank throughout the fight otherwise they're gonna take increased damage and potentially die. If you do those things the fight is going to be significantly easier as the only thing you have to heal is the people who get the flame spit debuff on them. Make sure to devote some spot healing to them as on higher keys the debuff could actually take you down to that. You will also have to do some AoE healing once the cloud burst happens and top everybody back up from the AoE damage as long as you didn't get silenced. And it does get a little bit more intense when phase 2 starts, that's when one of the two bosses gets down to 50% health. This next one is more of a DPS step but you want to focus the dragon because this is the one that does the most damage and you want to transition it below 50% as it lands and starts doing the frontal as you have extra time to DPS it down before it jumps back to the middle of the platform and phase 2 starts. Phase 2 is basically the same but now the dragon is going to jump up and do two flame spits and put two debuffs on two people instead of just one. So this is where people should be using their defensives and this is where you should be devoting your healing cooldowns to make sure you can heal through that. Keep in mind that the cloud burst, the interrupts and the winds are still going to happen and don't be scared to get pushed by the winds and heal as long as you don't get pushed on top of a fire patch you can still cast while you're sliding away. This phase could be quite chaotic if your group has no coordination so my advice here is as a healer try to stay relatively into the middle of the platform unless you're dropping flame patches on the ground. As it's quite common in pucks for people to get scared, run away out of your range and heals. Especially when they get the flame spits which makes it extremely hard to heal them. Again, having the weak aura here helps a lot if people follow the arrows because you will know where they're gonna be going. The hard part about surviving the first boss in Brackenhide Hollow is just healing through the gash frenzy which happens almost immediately after you pull the boss and then approximately every minute after. So the biggest healing tip here is pop your big cooldowns as soon as the fight starts and don't hesitate to use your defensives. If you have a way to remove a bleed because this is what the dot that the gash frenzy leaves on people is then don't hesitate to use that as well. Cat raising flame, bop, any kind of other immunities and of course if you heal somebody above 90% health the debuff disappears. Once you do that, just send extra interrupts towards the caster because the earth bolts can actually do a lot of damage, especially on the Ranica weeks and also save some spot healing for whoever gets targeted by the butchering fixate. Other than that the fight is pretty easy, you only have to shine every other minute when the gash frenzy happens and that's not gonna be that many times if your DPS is up to par. The most important thing about Veximus in Augitar Academy is to watch his energy bar. Once that reaches 100 energy he does his big pushback and AoE and if that overlaps with the mana bombs you need to be ready to use defensives, big healing cooldowns and basically everything in your spellbook as this is what could wipe you on this boss. Now there is a strategy where you can let one of the orbs that crawl towards the boss to be absorbed that's going to do a little bit of AoE damage and it's also going to give him energy. You can do that if you know that overlap is coming so he fills up the energy faster and the overlap does not happen but we can put that into the advanced tactics section. Other than that try to put some healing into people once they get the mana bombs before they explode so they can survive that especially on higher tyrannical keys and keep dispelling people who get more than one stack from absorbing the balls. Watch your feet when the pushback happens as there's swirlies that you need to dodge and basically this fight is all about surviving the overlaps when they happen. The Raging Tempest in Knockhood Offensive. Your main goal is to collect 10 orbs before the AoE phase happens so you're buffed to a maximum and you can heal through it. 
try to jumpstart by just collecting few extra orbs when you get the big blue circles but don't endanger yourself of killing somebody else or yourself and don't forget to pump up few heals after the big circles explode although you're not in a big hurry. The AoE phase itself is 15 seconds long so be prepared for that, pop your defensives early and if you can stagger your cooldowns a little bit so you have more healing towards the end. The other big tip for this phase is when the orbs spawn try to have one crawling towards you coming from behind and let it hit you towards the middle of the phase so it renews your debuff. You can also communicate with your teammates before the boss fight starts to let them know that you need to collect 10 orbs so they are not stealing them from you and you can also distribute the group cooldowns accordingly knowing when you're gonna need some help. For example if you know that you're not going to have a big cooldown for the second intermission you can call for people to use their personal defensives at this point. And also make sure to tell them to stack around the boss during the AoE phase. As it doesn't matter what kind of healer you're playing, every healer somehow benefits if people are stuck together. We should also mention that the boss gets a buff that buffs his damage and you can purge that if you have the opportunity to do so, either yourself or another class in the group, as this is going to make your tank less likely to die on a high tyrannical keys. Collapse towards the boss once the big blue circles are gone so you make sure you're in range of everybody and make sure you're pressing every possible button during the transition phase as it does a lot of damage apparently. One last piece of strategy that I'll give you here is for the first transmission I try to use a smaller but shorter cooldown which is going to rotate back later in the fight along with personal defensives to help you out as they're going to come back later as well and then for the second transmission I save a big cooldown as people usually don't have their defensives up yet so that gives them more time for them to get them back. Third boss in Nokut Offensive, Terra is going to do a lot of quick shots that target random people so you need to be prepared to spot heal them as sometimes she can randomly target the same person twice and they're going to take a lot of damage. Keep an eye for the white area where she's going to jump next so you can pre-move there when the big AoE circle happens for the fear. And of course make sure to stack when the Gale arrow happens. Now my best advice here is stack on top of the tank. Or at least stack on top of the melee even if you're ranged because that makes it very easy to know the location when you need to collapse and it also makes sure that all the tornadoes are stacked in one spot. If you have the range and the melee stacking separately you're gonna have two groups of tornadoes which makes it harder to dodge and stacking between the range could also be an issue especially if you have more people as range because they will not know exactly where to go to. Obviously save all personal defenses and healing cooldowns for the Gale Arrow as Terra is going to follow up with a quick shots before she leaps so you need to provide some healing to your teammates so they don't get one shotted after the Gale Arrow. And the last tip here, even if you stack the tornadoes perfectly and they're all at one spot, keep in mind that in a few seconds they come back and collapse to the point where they started from so you need to dodge them on the way back as well. Phase 1 of the last boss in Nokut Offensive, Balakar Khan, is actually not that intensive for healing. Make sure to spot heal your tank as the bleed that the boss leaves on them actually takes quite hard. Whoever gets the spear mechanic should run behind the rock that you see on the right of your screens as this makes two things. First, they cannot get charged because the boss is going to hit the rock and then second, he's gonna stay in melee range giving more uptime to your teammates. As you saw here, if you have some way to drop combat with the boss once he targets you with the spear, shadow melt, feign dead, invis, any of those things is actually going to drop the mechanic and you're not going to get it at all so make sure you utilize those if you have them at your disposal. If not, the damage should not be lethal in phase 1 so make sure to do some spot killing and dodge the frontal once that happens until 60% when the transmission phase starts. Keep in mind that once the boss runs to the middle he does a 4 second cast so the phase does not start immediately but once that happens you should be ready to use all of your cooldowns and defensives as everybody is going to be taking constant damage and you have to be dodging the swirlies on the ground. 
Do not hesitate to use more than one, even three cooldowns in this phase because the whole fight is basically surviving the transmission. And yes, your main job is healing, but especially if you have ranged interrupt, you should help to gather the mobs and then use all of your stuns and CCs in order to control the storm bolts because they're going to one shot people on high tyrannical keys. Phase 2 is easier on the tank because they don't get a bleed, they get a debuff that you should simply dispel, so they should be safe. But you should be ready to heal whoever gets the spear mechanic because they'll be taking double damage, once from the spear and one from the AoE that drags everybody in. If you get it, make sure to use a defensive, if you don't get it and you have externals or shield trinkets, anything that can help the person who got it, make sure to help them out. In phase 2 you can still use the rock for the charges, but keep in mind that later on when the boss gets the frontal, everybody drops a circle that leaves a permanent puddle on the ground, so if you're utilizing the rock, you should drag the boss away so you don't drop the puddles on top of the rock and then you can get back to it. Also, even if you range, try to stay close to the boss because it's easier to dodge the frontal cone, but also make sure to not stack on top of other people with the circle that you're dropping on the ground as you're going to take more damage. To be honest, you don't really need healing cooldowns for phase 2 as you have plenty of time to heal everybody up after the frontal and after the spear as long as they don't get hit by the swirlies on the ground. Which is one more reason why you should pop every single cooldown during the transmission phase. While phase 2 is more about surviving the one shots of the spear and the frontal and of course moving around and casting without getting hit by the swirlies. The third boss in Holes of Infusion could be very hard because there's a constant damage going out throughout the party for the entire fight. However, the most important part is bait the tornadoes on the open area and be sure there's nothing behind your back because if they hit something they explode and they can one shot you. Try to pre-move to the crystal that you're going to hide behind for the hailstorm and ask your tank to bring the boss in melee especially if you're not a ranged class. As for examples, I have a lot of trouble healing on my Mist River if the boss is in Narnia. Be very careful when you run inside from the Glacial Surge because there's a chance that a crystal spawns just in front of you and you get stuck and killed by the snow on the ground. That may sound dumb to you, but trust me, I know it happened more than once. And then as for healing, the biggest thing here is don't blow all of your cooldowns all at once, try to stagger them and put as much time in between them as you can, as you're not going to get any breaks throughout the fight. And you can also make a macro to spam in your party chat and ask your party members to blow their cooldowns for defensives, health pods, health stones, whatever they have, especially in moments where you have to move around and you don't have that much HPS going on. Of course, use your own as well and try to plan your cooldowns in a way that the shorter ones are going to come back at some point in the fight so you can use them at least twice. Sentinel Talondras could be quite hard in Udman, but there are a few things that you can do to make your fight easier and unfortunately most of them are not dependent on you as a healer. Obviously, whoever gets the bleed, pump heals into them and try to have them topped up just before the stomp goes off so they don't get one shot at. However, if you have ways to remove the bleed in your party, you should utilize them as well. Bob from Paladin works and if you have an evoker, Cauterizing Flames actually has a relatively short cooldown, they can get every other bleed. So just make sure to remind them if you're in a bug before the fight starts so they don't throw. The other big tip is that you can actually pre-stun every second crushing stomp. The first one is shortly after the boss goes into a new phase, but the second one is just before he casts the Tannic Empowerment, which you have to stun anyways. So instead of waiting for it to start casting, you can stun him 5 or 6 seconds early and not get any damage from the crushing stomp this way. And of course, keep in mind that any player abilities that stun actually count so you can use your own if he starts casting and you cannot drag him towards the yellow circles. One thing to mention though, if you decide to go for this strategy, make sure you coordinate it with your group, obviously because you're gonna need some extra stuns and your tank should be aware of that so they don't get angry that the boss is getting randomly stunned. 
few quick tips about Ember on the fourth boss in Udeman as well. Try to stay close to the wall away from active mobs that throw the flame orbs at you. Preferably communicate with your tank to do the same as well as this not only helps you to dodge the orbs in an easier way but also when phase 2 starts you're gonna be stuck at one point of the room and you're gonna be moving together as a unit which will make the healing easier which is not going to be the case if everybody is spread around because you were initially standing in the center. Also, when he casts Searing Clap, you can dispel the person with the lowest health percentage to make it easier to heal them back up. The last boss in Udeman is basically unhealable on higher tyrannical keys if you don't get a little bit of help from your friends. The Time Sync debuff affects 3 people and is going to kill somebody after the boss stomps if it's not dispelled. And the good news is that you can dispel it with any ability that removes movement impairing effects. Even more so, almost every class has something to do that, but the bad news is nobody freaking does it. So what I would do during this boss fight, even before the fight starts, I would remind people to use their freaking abilities. I would type in chat something like, Hunter please disengage, Druid please shape shift, Paladin use your freedom. And this is also a long shot but even before the key starts you can check if people are picking the correct talents because some classes don't pick these talents by default. The other day I went in here with a priest and I asked them several times before the key started to pick their phantasm talent for the last boss, they didn't and guess what happened? You guessed correctly, they easily died on the last boss and we wiped. Now if people are picking the correct talents though, what you should do is you have your own, as a shaman you have thunderous paws, as mist river you have tiger's lust, as paladin you have freedom, etc. So whenever the debuffs go out, you can use that skill to remove one of them either on yourself or an ally and then use your dispel to remove another one. There are indeed few classes that don't have a skill that they can use that often or at all so those should be your priority dispels. If you manage to handle the buff dispelling correctly this fight should be relatively easy and if you have no way to do it then good luck healing through it. And I'm gonna give you one more tip here, try to stack on top of each other as ranged and as melee so you can stack the pools and save some space in the room as the longer the boss fight runs the worse the space management is going to be, so try to save as much room as possible in advance. The Chains boss in Neltaras. The biggest tip here is that when he jumps on somebody he leaves a bleed and again if you have something that can dispel bleeds then this is actually overpowered because it's going to do a lot of damage to that person and you have to keep them topped off as soon as the chains go off so they don't die from that damage. However there's an extra trick that you can do here if you have something that can drop combat in your group, invisibility, feign death or even shadow melt. The person that gets targeted can press that button as soon as the boss starts casting dragon strike on them the boss is not going to even cast the skill, there's gonna be no bleed going off and that is going to make the fight much easier. Also keep in mind that the dragon strike is always casted to the person standing the furthest away so you can know in advance who's going to get targeted. Pretty much the same strategy can be used in the third boss forge master Gorek. Obviously you have to heal through the AoE from the fourth smashing but after that he's casting the Blazing Agus which is the red circles around the players. Those do even more damage but you have to pay attention who is the first target that he's going to cast the Blazing Agus in and if they have feign that invisibility shadow melt all those same abilities if they press that after he starts casting the shield does not go off at all. There is no damage, no swirlies on the ground, nothing, which of course makes everything extremely easier but it's actually a RNG who's going to get targeted first and if they don't have the skill obviously you have to deal with the mechanic. The tips for the last boss in Neltaras, Warlord Sarga are also not entirely healing related but they're definitely going to make the fight much easier if you follow them. 
if you have a cursed dispel in your group, keep in mind that you can pick more than one weapons from the piles on the ground. If you loot two piles though, you get a stacking debuff, but if you coordinate this, you can dispel the person who is going to pick up two piles in a quick succession. Get a weak core that's going to tell you what kind of an ability you have, and if you get the melee one, try to stay close to the boss. All the abilities you can cast while moving, no matter if they're melee or ranged, and all of them have a 1 second cast time. The boss's magma shield ability is 2.5 second cast time, so once you see him casting and the bar moves a little bit after the middle, you should be already pressing your button so you insta stun him once the shields go off. As for the rest, try to pick up the piles as soon as the shield is gone and the damage increase phase is done, or after he casts the frontal so you don't get sniped by it. Use any kinds of external and of course small healing cooldowns to keep the people with the molten gold alive. And it goes without saying, but watch your feet during the magma shield cast, as you can easily die in one of the swirlies. That will be all the tips for healing the hardest bosses in Season 4 of Dragonflight. Let me know if you have more tips or if I missed some of the bosses that you're interested in. We can definitely have more content on this topic. Thank you very much for watching and now get out of here.